right, Brooke, here we are. Now, are you still nervous? Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. See, now the whole interview is not going to be like this, is it? You're not going to no, get No, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, like, I just have to get it out. Oh, oh. How are you doing today? You any, I'm well. Do you have any gin? Are you drinking gin? Do I have gin? any gin? Um, no. That, but... No? Anything? Any spirits to calm you down? There you go. All right. That'll calm you down. Now we're going to have a completely non-lucid, absolutely <laughs> un right? oh. oh, Let it so be known that this is the first podcast I've ever done with somebody stoned out of her fucking mind. <laughs> as far as I know. Oh Probably my goodness. I've done a shitload of them, but I don't even know. Uh, I mean, I, I'm an aficionado, I will say. <laughs> Uh, yes, I gathered that. <laughs> I gathered that from our exchanges online. I think at one point you something you you sort of said that I always manage to to tweet you when you're stoned, and I think I said in response, "But that's like all hours of the day and night." It's it was rant. hilarious. It was hilarious, and I have to tell you that I cherish <laughs> that beyond measure. I told I my mom. Mother, fact, I'm sorry. I told I told my mom about that. And I got her to get on Twitter just for you. <laughs> it was so funny. I, I, know, I have an image of you and your mom driving around town, smoking doobies. I just, uh, you know, I got high with my mom. You years see ago. that? Because I've actually posted those before. Well, as somebody who got his mother high years and years and years and years and years ago, once. Uh, and I treasured it. <laughs> It's, it's an experience, that's for yes, sure. My, my brother went off to uh, <clears throat> to college. He then flunked out, but that's another story. And he left the pot farm. He had basically sort of started in the forest. We lived in the middle of the forest in Connecticut. And he gave my mother the watering can and the job of going out to the forest every day to water and cultivate his dope plants and harvest them. And I remember my mother walking back with her little gardening basket full of dope clippings and thinking, well, I, you know, whatever one might think about one's parents, my mom's pretty fucking cool. That that is uh that is a a superwoman mom moment. Um, she was a great mom. She was a behavioral psychologist. She was a skinnerian. Oh, so, yeah, she was always trying to subtly affect my behavior by, by, by deceit. And I, I, I began to cotton to it as I got older. It's like, I see what you're doing. <laughs> um, if, if, you, too young. if you don't mind, um, I just need to look here because I have an external microphone set up. Okay. And I just want to make sure. I think uh, microphone arrives. I think it's this one. Does that sound any different? Okay. It does. It does. You sound better. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> I would... You sound louder. You sound okay. Louder. Yeah. Do I need to like, back back it up here? No, no, no. No, it's great. It's great. I oh, could yeah. hear you fine before, but I have to tell you, I've um I've seen images. Is this your office, I assume? Uh well, that's a fancy word for it. Yes. This is this is uh, a room in our house where I happen to have the computer. <laughs> I suppose it's my office. It makes it sound like I do important shit. My office. Yes, this is my office. It's your man cave. Yes. Have that you... was my wife's office too, but yes. <laughs> Have you read all of those books behind you? No, yeah, that's what people always ask. Uh, <clears throat> no, no, I just, uh, I always wanted to be, I wanted to be a librarian growing up. And so I always wanted to kind of live in a library. I, I grew up with parents who loved books. So I lived in a house full of books and learned to read at a, at a very early age, I used to cut school and go to the library and call my mom and say, I didn't feel like going to fucking school. I'm at the yeah. library. And she would come nominally to pick me up and to chastise me. And instead, she would spend the entire day with me at the library. And we'd just like wander around the stacks and, and read. And, uh, you know, I mean, I so uh, my whole life, I've been a book collector. Uh, I probably have about 20,000 books. And uh, you can't possibly read them all. I mean, you know, I, I maybe I read 70 books a year, so I will die with shitload of books on read. But when you have books, when you're surrounded by books, they kind of yell at you to read more than you would otherwise read. If you don't have books in your house, you will not read books. I, I must say, I completely agree. Um, I, there's a quote 
I couldn't tell you who uh, said it, but uh, books are the gift that you can open again and again. Like, yes, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And there's I, also a quote that you never, you never wade in the same river twice. So every time you open the book, you've changed, and your perception of the book consequently has changed. So you can go back to a great book. In fact, I'm rereading now The Once and Future King by T.H. White, which I read when I was much younger and loved. And it's an entirely different experience. I hadn't, when I was younger, appreciated how political he was, how bitter he was, how savage his indictment of human beings was. <laughs> um, it's an entirely different take that I, I, you know, bring to it now. So I'm a great believer in rereading as well as reading. Oh. Which is what N Nabokov famously said: uh, "The only good reader is a rereader." Ah, uh, that is absolutely uncanny because I'm the same way, and you're actually like this is kind of cool because I've that's already a question off of my script I've written here, yeah. right? Is is what are you reading now? And that that's um, that's really that's. I completely agree. I've um, there are some books that I've reread like 10 plus times they're my absolute favorites um there's one book um it's called the pursuit of happiness have you have you heard of the will the smith Chris movie Chris yes oh yes yes the one i, audi I think i auditioned for that movie uh is it wait is that the one where he's a stockbroker and his kid with the kid or he's yeah 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 yeah, yeah. no i auditioned for another movie seven and a half pounds i think oh wow that is yeah. fascinating uh yes i i know of that book i've not read um i actually have you read stumbling on happiness no i haven't but i shall put that on my list because like i respect your opinions like so much i don't know if you've noticed sure, like any time i'm sorry no, no, that's quite right. Uh, yes, yeah, Stumbling on Happiness by a guy named Daniel Gilbert is also one of my favorite books. He's a, um, a Harvard shrink, and he has this wonderful uh, book, basically very, very good humored book. I mean, he's a, he's a lovely and very accessible writer, but it's essentially, we don't know what makes us happy. We, uh, we think we do, and we're so cocky and confident about it. We make a lot of bad choices based on on the notions we have about what will make us happy, but we don't really understand what will make us happy. And he goes on to kind of elaborate this thesis and it's, it's quite beautiful and quite lovely. I, it's one of my favorites. You'll have to, um, you should like, we'll have to um, write down those because I'm, I want to read them you, now and I can't- Well, you have, you, you're, you're presumably recording this. So that you <laughs> yeah, have, like go back live. through it. You can okay. go back and look. Daniel Gilbert, Stumbling on Happiness. That's the nerve speaking. I, yes, I'm, and I'll, I that's all right. I'll, you see, you don't even have to ask questions. I just will talk because that's my nature. Another book in that vein, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, I think is his last name. I've never known how to pronounce it. One of two um, uh, uh, psychologists who collaborated on a variety of different uh, uh, papers together. One of the Two gentlemen passed away the survivor basically consolidated their work and wrote a book about it and his his principle is we we don't realize all the ways in which our thinking is fucked up because we don't actually think deeply we think reflexively automatically and usually we're just like rats in a, in a maze not cognizant of the wheel we've constructed that we're running around uh, also a little a little uh, uh, a little harder to read because it gets a bit abstruse and he's kind of a bit of a mathematician. So he begins to introduce some formulae that can be a little oh. off putting, but really, really, really worth struggling through those parts that are hard because gonna... the parts that aren't hard are great. I might have to read that one. But um, fast and slow. Fast and slow. Yes. Uh, the Pursuit of Happiness book. Um, I actually, uh, he, I have an autographed copy of that one and it is one of my like most prized possessions and like i it's such a good star trek fans love your autographs i have to say <laughs> autograph bless. yes you built me a house thank the, you build your uh, i told you i would vote for you for president i would thank you but when it turns out what people will find out eventually that i'm an atheist with a foul mouth and i ain't gonna get <laughs> so um how are you guys how are you guys holding up under the lovely quarantine conditions necessary though they might be? 
Well, you know, I mean, we're blessed and privileged. I'm 60 and my wife and I have had a very nice run professionally. So we don't, we didn't have kids. So we saved all our dough. I don't need to work. I do work really hard as the president of the board of the Hollywood Food Coalition, but that's my choice. That's volunteer work. Um, but in terms of what most people are going through, having their livelihoods threatened and on top of the horrors of the virus, not knowing whether or not, you know, our economy is going to return to a point where they're going to be able to work again. I mean, certainly artists, you know, people in my field, people in um, music business, in any of the performing arts, I mean, there's a big gulp. When are you going to be able to go to a theater again or a concert again or a play, you know, I mean, uh, so it's, that's fairly terrifying. Uh, certainly in California, you know, all the beds are full. Uh, oh. you know, I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. And to see what just happened and forgive me, I'm extremely political, but to see. No, what, I expected happened. it and I wanted to get into it. So launch yeah, I mean, off of your soapbox. Well, I mean, Go above ahead. and beyond, above and beyond the horrors of the last week or so to now see that three Democratic Congress people have uh, contracted COVID because even locked down in a room together, Republicans were still refusing to wear their fucking masks I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, I, there really is no punishment I can devise in my most medieval mindset that is appropriate to the level of obscenity many of these back, sons like, of bitches have come to represent. Capital, like different forms of capital punishment, the more medieval ones. I, it's I, despicable. I, it's, it's despicable. It's despicable. It is, it it's is despicable. quite despicable. What's happened, what's happened to us? you know, over the arc of time, but particularly over the course of the last four years has really just been, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I only hope this is my, I guess, you know, when I'm trying to be an optimist, optimism, John, um, is that a mask needed to come off the idea that somehow America, ha you know, it's shit doesn't stink, which is always bug the hell out of me because you know we're all just human beings on this planet the, greatest the idea that we're exceptional that our exceptional country with you know exceptional people living exemplary values it's like mm -hmm. country that enslaved people that allowed people to fundamentally lynch people legally until as late as 1964 has a hell of a lot to fucking answer for and you know i, I hope people's if scales fall from people's eyes because of the monstrousness of these last four years, I suppose that's the, you know, the Benny. Anyway. It's just, it's just shameful. It really is. I was appalled and I, I don't have cable. I, I refuse to pay for it. That's the whole thing I could go off of, but I just saw it. I'm on Twitter all the time and I saw I it. <laughs> Um, and I just saw like a couple of my friends saying stuff and I was like, what in the world is going on? And I like looked at theirs and then clicked through a couple threads and I was just like, like literally clutching my pearls and like, I, I have just as filthy of a mouth as you do. And I just, I, I, oh, I, I fucking like, doubt that. <laughs> Uh, my brother was a sailor, so... You know. My father was a sailor. My father was a gay sailor, so... I, <laughs> Power to the people! Like, seriously, that... I mean, he was a awesome. closeted gay sailor. You have to, you know... As it had... 19, 1945, as it had he enlisted. Oh, yeah, as it, as it had to be. Yeah. Back, back then, it, it's yeah. just... Uh, yeah. It just, uh, yes. it, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that the gay men were supposed to be closeted, I wouldn't exist, uh, perversely. So, you know, it's an ill I wind mean, that blows no one good. Uh, yes, he was he was forced to marry and forced to breed by by a certain cultural. <laughs> I think he only, I think he and my mother only had sex twice and I was a second kid. So really, it's quite a miracle. The great opening sentence of Bill Bryson's wonderful book, A Short History of Nearly Everything, is congratulations, reader, it's a miracle you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and you think of all the things that had to happen to present the world with you and all of your particularity and specificity. And that's always for me, I think, like, you know, talk about a hurdle, hurdle. It's like, Jesus, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for summoning twice.
he did his duty he did his duty twice i know i know and i i can make fun of the both of them my mom and my dad because they're both dead and i don't believe that they're ghosts looking down from the afterlife so <laughs> i can say whatever the fuck i want uh-huh. i just i love you so much <laughs> this is great oh my god um so uh, like you mentioned about the books that it was a common question. What is the most common question that you get at cons or wherever? And and do you find repeat? How long did it take for you to put the makeup on? Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, I think yeah. I, I watched one recently and you said like nine or 10 hours. That's Oh, I make up the stories. I've just, you know, I change my story every time just to amuse myself. Sometimes I say, oh, I'll just slap it on myself. It takes about 15 minutes. I do it at home. Just a little rubber here, little rubber there. And off we go to work. But then I realize that actually some people do believe that. Obviously, we live in a world in which we should always accept the fact that people will believe any fucking thing. Really- so, you know, I, I, I have to always then say, that's not true. We had a wonderful team of professional makeup artists. It took two and a half to three hours. Is that all it took? It seemed like long enough to me. I'm Uh, sure it did, but like, I can't believe you said nine or 10 hours. Yes, I know. Well, you know, Jim Carrey famously, when he was the Grinch in that Grinch movie, I think he was in the makeup chair for seven or so hours. I mean, when you think that you you spend a full working day getting ready to start your working day. (laughs) It's um, like, whoo, yeah. Um, I I can't imagine the touch-ups and everything because like you have to sweat and stuff uh yeah, yeah, although, yeah, yeah i mean there are a couple of things one is it, it while i did have to wear the makeup i also got to wear pajamas <laughs> other people had to wear those kind of like tight fitting you know peck and ab clinging goddamn suits um and, and i i didn't and that was nice because you know the, co- the costume was drafty which i appreciated it did look quite um, beautiful and two, I, I was number seven on a call sheet. You know, there's seven of us. I was number seven. I, I was the one guy who wasn't expected to have fist fights or woo alien babes. I mean, I was the character guy. So I'd work a couple of days a week. So it was like, eh. every now and again, I'd have an episode that revolved around me. But generally speaking, people who actually know me and have followed me and have gone to conventions will know this song, but you may not, uh, a song I used to sing when I was sort of sauntering off the sound stage on my way home after having done my one scene for the episode. <laughs> I, would sing. This is, this, I did this mostly because it really pissed Dominic off and I always got great joy in pissing Dominic off. I would sing the day off, day off, six days off and the check still come, character actor in the sun, six days off and the check still come. They they finally banned me from singing that song. That's absolutely hilarious. And I did listen to one of the podcasts that you were on recently, and you sang that song. And I I, was, I, I, I know it's probably my my proudest accomplishment was that, that song. Is, that only is. because I liked to rankle Dominic, and he would go, hey, "I'll just go away. Then. I'll see you next week. Go away." <laughs> <laughs> he did have to work hard, didn't he? Well, he had to work harder than I did. I, I mean, they all had to work harder than I did. I had a, I had a cushy job. I mean, you know, I mean, there were episodes where I had a fair amount to do. And, and in, in fairness to myself, when you had a busy episode or when you, when I have you, a dog. I'm sorry. Her name is Hoshi, by the way. Oh, oh well, I'm not. Sure I don't know if you heard it, and I just, I just about died of embarrassment. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear it. I didn't. I'm hear sorry. It. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Now she's fucking interrupting me. She's got her first podcast. And what she did, she's interrupting the guest. Oh, my God. I'm going to write Podcasts International and, and write a, a very stern letter of complaint. <laughs> I put on. And she immediately started. And she had a dog <laughs> bark through the entire podcast. Outrageous. What kind of dog? She, uh, I, we actually don't know what she is. <laughs> She's um. Some Does she kind of, have four legs? Does she? Yeah, have she's ears? some kind of terrier. There's no. Okay. There's no interspecies kind okay. of. Come here, come here, you. Oh no! I I I will uh, I will wait and see see uh, see the dog. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, oh okay. yeah, he's got a bunch of stuff going on there. Doesn't wow. he's got the ears of a chihuahua? She's a girl, and I named her after I named her after Hoshi, after Linda's okay. character. So she's got the ears of a chihuahua, but the, the muzzle of like a uh, terrier, like a terrier or something. Yeah. And my baby. Now All go right. on. And be All right. <laughs> Bye, Hoshi. Out. Go. Go. Be good. <laughs> I love you, but be good. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's probably the most common question I get asked. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I think the other question that gets asked a lot is, is are, were we close as a cast and do we socialize together? That was one of mine. Uh, and uh, see, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure you're going to come up with some, some clever and innovative questions that have never been asked before. Um, I, I promise you that I am. I promise right. you that I am. Uh, yeah, and 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 in fact, I think if we had gone seven seasons, we probably would have gotten tighter. But you know, we were truncated. We only lasted four, so uh, we were although... jacked, all of us. And that was another question. You're just taking off my unproductive ones, so we have more time to talk. Oh, about okay. Them. Well, yes, yeah, so these are there's, there's a reason why they all get asked. So I, I can I can pretty much interview myself, and uh, no, and you don't even have to be here. You can go leave the room. You can play with your dog, and I'll do the whole interview all by myself. No, I love um, you. I want to be here. Um. Yeah, really sweet people, and I love them all, although, you know, hardly ever see Jolene anymore. She married, has three kids. I don't know if she's really in the business. She doesn't come to conventions. Um, everybody else, uh, it's always a treat when I see them on the convention circuit. Of course, now, you know, we're all in COVID world, so we're that's going to be another year or so. Um, but I, I think four, four years as opposed to seven years, there was another level of, of bonding that kind of allows you to be, and also a show that because it was relatively unpopular, didn't necessarily result in quite the same level of, um, of attention, which brings you together more often. You know, oddly as a cast, you're invited to more conventions as a cast, you go to more functions as a cast. So some, some of the closeness was perhaps um, uh, mitigated by the fact that we weren't really thrown into, into situations together after the show went off the air. So you, you, were, just, you were just an actor doing a job basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a great gig. I mean, don't get me wrong. And I like the people and, and there are aspects of the show I liked. There were episodes I liked. I, I, I you know, have nothing negative to say oh, really cool. about the experience. But yeah, I, I wasn't a Star Trek fan. I'd watched some of the original show. I'd maybe watched an episode or two of The Next Generation, you know, channel surfing. But uh, it wasn't a particular, you know, thing of mine. I had a friend who was a big Star Trek fan. So when I got the show, it was like, you need to give me a crash course because I don't understand who, who the fuck are the, this, who are these people? What are the, what are, what are the hoobie doodles? Hoobie doodles? So he kind of like said, I'll give you, I'll give you the, you know, and he, he was great. He kind of gave me the, the skinny on like, what's an Andorian and what's a this and what's a that and showed me, you know, which episodes in the canon I should familiarize myself with. But I still, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not, I like to read. I do too. I'm actually reading some Star Trek books right now. That ah, uh, that's not real. No. Give me a book, book. A book, a book based on a television show. <laughs> oh, now, I've, now I, I've poked. Now I've poked the hornet's nest. Oh no, God no, not no, not your hornet's nest. All the fans. Oh no. <laughs> Yes, I'm a book snob. What can I tell you? I am too, actually. I um, on my shelf, I have copies that I read, and then I have copies that are just there to look at, and you don't touch them, and nobody's allowed to borrow my books. I'm not a snob in that sense. They can do. <laughs> don't make me look bad now. Snob in the sense that I do, I do, I do distinguish between the well-written book and the perhaps. I I empathize with that too because if it's crappy I can't read it. What other questions you got for me? What other I actually want to know how you got involved with the Hollywood Food Coalition. Um, I've always been a volunteer my whole life uh, in in different ways, uh, and uh, when Trump won. Uh, you know, I felt such a deep, as so many people did, a deep sense of despondency for what it signaled, what it meant. And uh, in trying to kind of figure out how to respond myself, just in a way that made me feel good about being in the world, 
I started an activist group called PUSH, which meant uh, people unwilling to sit on their haunches. And uh, I, uh, the premise was that I wanted to try and do what I could to help awaken people's volunteeristic spirit by helping them identify their volunteer bliss. What is it that might lead you, Joe Shlobotnik, to volunteer more? And in trying to get this off the ground, I felt like, well, um, I want to try and myself get involved in a couple of actions that people could attach themselves to that would have meaning. So I volunteered on a congressional campaign and I started volunteering at the Hollywood Food Coalition. Uh, the congressional campaign, the candidate I was working for uh, lost in the primary. Uh, I continued to work for the woman who eventually won, Katie Hill, <laughs> who unfortunately made some rather unfortunate decisions. So her term was not successful. Uh, but I found that the biggest response I had amongst the people that I was trying to um, activate, I suppose, for lack of a better word, was to the Hollywood Food Coalition. And as I got more and more involved in it and um, took on more responsibility myself as one of the people who was fighting to see it grow and expand its sense of mission and its purpose while continuing to observe our core responsibility to serve a great hot meal every night of the week to people who are living on the streets. Um, I ended up uh, becoming, in essence, one of the co-executive directors, volunteer co-executive directors, and um, and I'm now the president of the board. So, it, you know, like all things that you do, because you are attracted to the cause, you uh, it begins to consume you, and it kind of took over my life a little bit, but in a wonderful way. I'm very proud of being involved in it. I think I think it's it's um, a terrific organization with a terrific mission and a marvelous group of people led by one of the most marvelous human beings I've ever met, a woman named Sherry Banana, who was our executive director, has been with the organization for 20 years. We've made her our first paid executive director about a year or so ago. She's one of those people you meet that you just kind of, you just feel like her, uh, her nobility of soul shines forth in a way that makes you want to say, I'm working with you. Um, and we are now, um, and my wife is another person who I just have more admiration than I could ever profess. Um, she's helped to expand our capacity to rescue and consequently share food. So we now have a second space. We have a kitchen where we serve a hot meal to all comers seven nights a week. We try and serve a hot five course meal to anybody who shows up, largely people who are experiencing homelessness. We provide uh, additional support, shoes, socks, toiletry kits, hats, gloves, tents, sleeping bags. We have a UCLA medical dental van, uh, a vision van come out periodically. Um, the second space, all the food we rescue lands there. It gets culled, sorted, weighed, and then shared with, at this point, around 62 participating not-for-profits all over the city. And the gag is, is that we try and uh, observe the same value uh, a, a, that we, we honor at our home kitchen, which is good food regularly provided. And then for the organizations we share with, hopefully served in a respectful fashion, helps build certain um, ties of community. Um, we, we call our uh, home dinner a community dinner. And we believe that the um, community dinner concept the idea that people gathering around the table to have good food is really integral to a, a certain spreading of dignity and respect amongst groups. Um, I go on about this because it's something I'm very passionate about. But the groups we work with do all sorts of cool things. It's groups that might work with drug and alcohol rehabilitation, you know, people who are experiencing drug and al alcohol uh, dependencies. Uh, uh, women who are trying to leave abusive relationships, kids who are living on the streets, all of these programs, great programs providing great services, but they didn't have a great meal program. So we're kind of basically saying, let food be the way in to help you guys bond your clients ever closer and, and help buttress all the other work your program wants to do, if that makes sense. It, of course it does. And I have to tell you, the um the aspect of respect and dignity that you guys are trying to bring to this is very important um you don't know me from adam so i mean there's no way that you would know this but i experienced a very extended 
period of homelessness in my life, actually, when I was going to college. And it's what led me to develop a chronic illness in which I had to drop out. So it's like the homelessness created just a domino effect, such as it does for so many people. And there is such an undertone of, I don't even know how to describe it, but, but it's just, you feel like nothing, you feel insignificant. And that's why I really wanted to ask you more about this. And that means so much that you guys are trying to add dignity and respect to it because there, there is so little of that for the homeless and and underprivileged community. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it, it cuts both ways because, you know, one of the things that I really believe in strongly is because we, we ask people to come in and volunteer to help cook the meal and serve the meal. And we ask people to come and volunteer at the exchange where the food is collected and redistributed. It's a volunteer board. Uh, it's, 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 we now have a paid staff, which I'm very proud of because we needed to expand. We needed to grow our staffing capacity. But we've always largely been driven by the volunteer impulse. And to me, what happens when somebody volunteers to work with a community that the, the instinctive aversion to might make them normally turn their head, is it in the volunteer's eyes suddenly makes you go, oh, there but for the grace of fucking God go I, you know? Which is what all of us should think. I mean, one finger snap and most of us could lose it all. And so to me, the idea that making creating mechanisms to rem- to allow people to remind people that the common humanity is what is what 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 has to bind us together four out of ten this statistic always staggers me four out of ten Americans if met with an unexpected four hundred dollar tab you know your roof collapses your car breaks down a medical bill goes through the roof they don't have the money to pay it I mean four out of ten in yeah. I mean, it's just the way, you know, I, I mean, the, the nature of our vulnerability in the richest country in the world, you know, it's so, it, 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 it's infuriating because th- this was a set of political choices that we have made. And a lot of scoundrels have essentially convinced people that they should care more about things like our racial and our, our gender and our, our, our nominal differences than the thing that should bind us together, which is outrage at the way we're getting fleeced by a bunch of fucking billionaires. It is infuriating. Um, It really, it, it, there are, they're just, it's insane. Yeah. So, you know, again, I digress, but um, yes, I agree with you. You know, so much of what, and my, my executive director, who I'm sure I drive crazy because I'm really political and she's really not political. She wants to keep talking about the work, the work, the work, the work on the ground, what she is able to do by way of immediately like saying, hi, who are you? How are you? What can we do for you? She really sets the example and the tone and a tenor for the whole organization. It, it is a, an organization about, we are just fucking people with people. So let's, let's be here to try and, and be as gracious and warm as we can possibly be. Everybody deserves the dignity of a decent meal every day. Everybody deserves to be treated with courtesy. Everybody deserves to be, be respected. And, and you know, you get what you give. That allows people to maybe feel like, okay, I trust you. And that means that maybe we can help attach them to a jobs program or a housing referral service or get the medical care that they might otherwise refuse. That's what, when we say food is the way in, to me, it's like the consistency and regularity of a good meal allows you to build some ties. And when you build ties, you can begin to help people climb up the hierarchy of need. You know, we kind of basically say, look, start with a meal. Then there is some immediate medical attention you might need. You know, you need a pair of shoes, you need a hat, it's freezing outside, you need a sleeping bag. And then there's a medical van, you know, maybe you need some shots, maybe you just need some some medical attention. And then there's like, you know, you need a place to live, a roof over your head. And then you may need, and it could profit from some, some counseling, some therapeutic help that might allow you to kind of get at some of the stuff that has kind of, you know, you know, maybe brought you to a pass. You don't trust people. And then there's a possibility of a job and there's a ladder. 
but you got to start on the foundation level first you got to eat every day you know so one thing anyway that he needs yeah so that's that's uh you know the hollywood food coalition check it out h-o-f-o-c-o.org and i'm i'm sure you'll put all the little you know bells and whistles up for me all the different places you can find out about us um blah 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 donate blah 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 yada 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 and, and blah 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 i have one more question related to that does uh does your wife really draw on the bags like that no she doesn't draw on the bags but she runs in coordination one of the things we do every sunday is, is a program that we call uh sunday uh, bag lunch extravaganza yeah. And basically a, a terrific community group called Hodge, H-O-D-G, Hang Out, Do Good. They're a marvelous progressive group, sort of like uh, Indivisible. They do a lot of wonderful political work, but they also do some social service stuff. And one of the things they do is they help coordinate 700 families who take turns participate in making these sack lunches. Uh, the families drop off the sack lunches every Sunday at different hubs all over the city where volunteer drivers load them up and drive them to us. We unpack all the lunches at the Hollywood Food Coalition. We organize them by category, salami, tuna, yada, yada. And then as the day progresses, 30 not-for-profit groups show up. We load all the cars with uh, uh, an assemblage of different kinds of sandwiches, and they fan out all over the city and share them with about 6,000 people living in homeless encampments, among, among other groups. Um, so, it, which I love because that means every Sunday from the hundreds of families who are participating to the dozens of volunteers who are driving, helping to collate and collect and share to the people who are, who are receiving it's really excellent, like eight element sack lunches, sandwich, fruit, juice, chips, yada, yada, yada. That's thousands of people on one day every week who come together as a community. And I, I, I'm a great believer that, you know, you, you have to find ways to bring people together in communities of service. You know, every barrier you can break down can get broken down if people can find ways to work together to help other people. I think that is what, what we need as the connective tissue to repair a deeply broken world. And it has to start on your community level. And there's a way for everybody to do that. That's the thing that I also kind of proselytize about. It's like, for me, it's food insecurity. It may be something else for somebody else. It may be, you know, the ecology, you know, saving the world from global warming. There is a group, maybe it's about education, you know, maybe it's about, you know, the kids not knowing how to read. There's a way to dig into your community to give back and to bring other people to the table too. And it will rebuild your life and it will rebuild your community's life. And then you rebuild the world. And you have to do it locally. Yeah. I just, I really, that's exactly why I created this podcast is because there needed to be more love within the Star Trek community. I recently joined the Star Trek community within the last couple years. I've been on Twitter since like 2009, but I recently, uh, came back to Star Trek and like, I don't want to make you sad or anything, but um, I have had Take like- best shot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I like a challenge. Let's do this. <laughs> um, okay, hold on, just hold on. You're two hours ahead of me. I'm not allowed to smoke dope until noon. It's only 11.40 here, so. Oh, who cares about social rules? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways you know how 2020 has basically been the year of hell for like everybody yeah <laughs> um so like that's basically been the last three years for me um in 2017 I had a boyfriend uh, um a, a lover pass away and oh, it was sorry. very traumatic uh, I'll spare you the horrible details, but I have PTSD from it. Um, I was he healing from that for about a year. Um, and then uh, in 2019, I'm doing my best here to not like get all emotional. But um, in 2019, my uh, brother passed away. 
and that was very hard. And this is his thumbprint around my neck here. Mm -hmm. um, and then right before Christmas, this this year of well last year because it's January I'm still kind of stuck on the time but um last December my grandpa passed away right before Christmas so like I've kind of had a lot, a lot happen to me in the past few years and that's why I turned to Star Trek because I kind of grew up with it and mm -hmm going through these horrible things that was like the only thing I knew that I could grasp grasp for and just the things that you said just then and then like my idea for this podcast it really it really resonates with me and I I kind of can't believe it's happening right now <laughs> well you know for what it's worth I mean you know because I think you know a lot of the podcasts I participate in kind of have a Star Trek you know I, I there's some people uh locally that I kind of dig who do a podcast based on you know calls to service so the guests on the podcasts are people working in the community who are doing really really cool things that people might want to say oh that's intriguing I'd like to get involved with that so that may be some way to kind of jigger your podcast around specific calls to action because that's the one thing that I kind of sometimes feel is that um, while I appreciate the values of Star Trek, or at least some of the values of Star Trek, <laughs> I, I, I also feel sometimes that the trap of Star Trek is that it posits this perfectible man. You know, here we are in the future and we've banished negativity and we all get along just fabulously. And it can sometimes sort of elide the question of how do you get from where we are <laughs> which is, you know, obviously a world with a lot of woe and a lot of strife and a lot of cantankerousness to that, 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 you know, utopia. And it's action. It's hard day in, day out work to try and figure out how to make a difference in this world. And I sometimes think that we as, as Star Trek fans can get a little bit lost in the, in the storytelling and kind of pat, pat ourselves on the back sometimes for believing in something that espouses such, you know, virtue, but we don't necessarily honor the, the concomitant call to action. What actions do we take to make a difference in our own community? Um, and that's hard, it's a challenge, you know? And that, that's where I always kind of feel like things like this, podcasts, the different ways in which people are trying to communicate with other people and bring folks together that's something that I always kind of feel like should be a, um, uh, a part of the part of the purpose is to is to get people a little stirred up to do shit. You know, I don't know if you know this, but like the motto or tagline for my podcast is literally bringing the community together. Like it's why I created it. So I'm everything you say. I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> I just, I really admire your humanitarian. You use your platform for such good and it's so admirable. Well, it's funny. I mean, I don't even think of myself as having a platform. I'm a vaguely recognizable character actor. I got 12,000 followers. Like, you know, I mean, I, it's like, I don't think that's much of a platform, but I will say that I'm not particularly shy about, you know, speaking up and I don't, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I, I, I have no uh, uh, a real affinity for, although <laughs> those who know me would say, oh, bullshit, for the limelight for its own sake. I didn't have a bigger career because I didn't really care that much about um, fame and celebrity and success and money. I just, I like the work. I like going to work, but I didn't particularly want to do all the things that you have to do to get to a higher level. I hated the fucking red carpet stuff and socializing and going to parties and dressing up. I hate wearing suit and tie. I don't like any of that stuff. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's it, any platform I have is pretty incidental in a weird way. Um, some of the folks who are celebrities writ large who can attract millions of people like a George Clooney, I really admire what he does to use his platform to really effectuate major change in the world. I'm just a little person and a little bit of my slice of the world trying to speak up, you know? It, 
it's very, very admirable. You mentioned um, George Clooney. Have you heard about Ashton Kutcher and the um, co the charity or uh, called Thorn that he created? Um, they created mm -hmm. software that hunts down child predators on the dark oh. web, which is an insanely hard thing to do. Cool. It's I just thought wow. that was amazing. No, I did. I did not know that. I I worked with um, oh I can't remember her name. Um, I did a movie about uh, playing, unfortunately, the predator. Um, of course, I always play villains. Um, <laughs> I did a movie set in uh, in Cambodia about the uh, international trafficking of young children, and the uh, woman who was the female lead. Uh, I'm embarrassed that her name is escaping me. I'm sure it will come to me. She was the UN advocate for uh, for the for the cause of fighting international child enslavement. Um, and yes, she too was somebody who I I really admired for taking her her stature as a celebrity and really turning it to good purposes. Um, I mean, you know, it's funny because the thing the thing that always is like you know the double edged sword is like you get a lot of people in the world. The whole thing like shut up and dribble you know it's like if you are a known because you're a singer or an actor or a, you know an athlete who then begins to talk about politics and social issues a whole group of people will turn around and say what the fuck do you know shut the fuck up and and it, 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 in a way i get that because it does seem as if you know you're sort of standing on a platform that was built on the basis of this other skill set and pretending that you have a right to hold forth on things that you know you may not know that much about so I, I i get where you have to be a little delicate about claiming for yourself a platform to hold forth on shit because you have a celebrity based on other things i understand why there's a tension there you know i cannot stand up and say that i know enough about um, uh, all the various uh, things that come into play that cause impoverishment in this world. I'm not a social scientist. So I, I kind of always in talking about this tend to want to, you know, and I tend to blab a lot, but I also have to kind of back off and say, look, I'm not professing to be a fucking expert. I just do this, I do this one thing in my little corner of the world that I believe in and I try and talk about it, it's hard not to kind of fulminate, uh, <laughs> which is why I'm not the executive director. I'm too much of a fulminator. I'm probably too much of a fulminator to be a board president, really. I should just be like vice president of fulmination. That would be my role. <laughs> you're just or vice president of bloviation, depending upon whether you're a partisan or, 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 or an antagonist. Oh, absolutely hilarious. Oh, let me see here. Well, talking about politics again, and you know, you mentioned how Star Trek kind of is painted with this broad stroke of idealism about, you know, the state of things and how do we get from here to there. What do you think we can do to grow closer together? Well, again, I mean, you know, I, I, some of, I, there are a few things that I think politically need to happen. We used to have uh, something called the Fairness Doctrine. The uh, FCC essentially said that if you are given um, uh, rights to use a portion of the airwaves to broadcast, you have an obligation to have a balanced presentation of political viewpoints. The uh, Fairness Doctrine was eliminated um, many years ago under Reagan. And since then, uh, it's led to, I think in part, the huge growth of these um, networks, Fox specifically, that uh, have no um, obligation to try and present a balanced viewpoint. I, I think to my mind some, and I, I think you're seeing it right now in terms of what some of the social media companies are doing to try and finally rein in um, language that borders on incitement or is actually incitement. I think generally speaking, we have got to grapple with the distinction between free speech and incitement. 
And I think there are a lot of specific ways to do it. One is, I think, returning to some version of the fairness doctrine for, um, for media as we know it, for television stations. And another, I think, is we have to look at ways to, um, I don't believe that necessarily it's, it's a function of their monopolistic tendency, breaking, people are arguing that you need to break up Facebook and, th and that there's gonna be a robust conversation about how we can do this. I do think that we have to have a considerably more activist role as a, as a governance when it comes to determining what the difference is between um, uh, free speech and militarized speech. And there have to be some observable processes that social media companies engage in to draw those lines in a way that we all agree to. Uh, Timothy, uh, uh, actually, I think I have that book here. This is a great book. Uh, Timothy Garden Ash wrote this book called Free Speech, which I think is a terrific book. And it really tries to grapple with this because obviously it's a slippery slope. I mean, you know, as soon as you start saying that's, ba -ba -ba, don't say that, you can't say that, you know, that's a slippery fucking slope. But on the other hand, if you can continually espouse the big lie, Hitler's big lie, and millions of people come to believe that an election that was, you know, completely legitimate was faked, you break the democracy, you know? So somehow this question of speech, of what, of, of how you, how you determine the difference between speech that is, 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 is free and speech that has become incitement. The famous adjuration, you know, it ain't free speech to call fire in a crowded theater. To my mind, a lot of people are saying, fire, fire, get your guns, there's a fire. I don't think that that can quite constitute free speech. Uh, but that's a slippery fucking slope. Additionally, uh, we, you, the, the Supreme Court has, unfortunately, I mean, this is the pickle we're in. The Supreme Court had a whack at addressing redistricting. Right now, there are some individual states that are attempting to, in essence, say, instead of drawing congressional, you know, the, right now, the way individual states draw their congressional districts is the, the state legislature does it. There are some states that are saying, put that job into the hands of, a, of an independent board comprised of people from different walks of life, balancing their political affiliations so that the districts that are drawn are competitive districts. So that if I'm running for office and I'm a Democrat and you're running for the same office and you're a Republican, we have to have a pretty honest and robust debate because we're trying to attract you know, enough votes to win, but it's not rigged in advance. If I'm running as a Democrat and you're running as a Republican and there's a 70% Republican voting population and a 30% Democratic voting population, then you can say whatever the fuck you want. You don't have to worry about winning. The only thing you have to do is beat your opponent in a primary. That's the real election. And that person in the primary is probably going to try and outflank you from the right or from the left, depending upon the, you know, I, I believe that redistricting has to, has to be taken away from the legislatures, put in the hands of these independent nonpartisan panels so that the district boundaries can be drawn in a way that brings moderation back to the politics. I completely- And the other thing, this is hard. Our, our constitution essentially, this is a whole federalist versus states right argument that always is fucked up. I, I, I'd love to get rid of the electoral college. I don't see how we do it. I'd love to revisit the idea that every, sen every state gets two senators, Wyoming. You know, there ain't eight goddamn people in Wyoming. They have as much senatorial representation as California, which is the equivalent of the seventh largest country in the world. That to me is one of the, one of the problems we have politically. The, populations politics are not represented effectively in the federal in the government that is very true unfortunately outside of a constitutional convention which you know good luck that's not going to change so what are the ways we can begin to rejigger things so that we have um, a, a whack at having our government actually reflect the will of the people and to me, that has to do with a national push to try and transform 
some of the ways we vote. I would, for instance, I'm all for more absentee balloting. I believe that uh, Tuesday should be a national day off. Uh, we should find a way to have the federal government back up, create a fund that is large enough for the states to draw on so they do not have to close polling stations. Right now, there is a swath of 13 or 14 states across the country that consistently closed polling stations, usually in districts heavily, heavily populated by African Americans and, and Hispanics. And it's, it's, it's voter suppression. The claim was they were doing that for economic reasons. I would say break that claim by creating a fund to make sure that no polling station has to get closed, subsidize in essence, all of the state government's polling stations. You've got to find ways to, to, to force the Republican party. And it is the Republican, it's the Republican party that is doing this. They don't believe that they can continue to hold power if everybody has a chance to vote. If black people are allowed to vote and Hispanic people are allowed to vote freely, if poor people are allowed to vote, if it's easier for people to vote, they will lose because their policies are not actually popular. So they try and suppress the vote. Ultimately, we have to figure out how we can fight back. How do you stop voter suppression? You know, so yeah, those are my short, although long-winded answers. <laughs> I find them very interesting. You mentioned Black and Hispanic people. I am Hispanic. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, a lot of Hispanic people don't even vote because they don't feel like their voice matters. I am not one of those people. I proudly vote. But um, Hispanic people, there, there is a, it's hard to describe, but there's a culture. A culture, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's it's a much culture. More famil it's familial more than it is political. And, and yeah, if you, and I agree, if you, if you look at the history of Latin and South America, you know, I mean, it, it's, it self-perpetuates. That's the biggest problem. When you begin to feel that government doesn't function for hundreds and hundreds of years, Latin American countries have suffered from terrible, autocratic, incompetent and repressive governments. So why would citizens growing up in those countries feel like they should participate in governments? Their goal is to avoid government to hide from it, to create a family structure that protects them from the depredations of government. The problem is when you move into a, 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 a world in which the democracy is only as strong as your participation in government, those cultural attitudes can actually cut, you know, you kind of cut off your nose to spite your face if you don't participate. I mean, I, the, the, of all the things to me, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a, um, I get, I get on a, a soapbox. Please feel free if you want to kind of get into a, a lighter mode. When Reagan said, "We want to know the, the the worst thing you could ever hear? Here's a horrible thing. Knock knock. I'm here from the government and I'm here to help." Ha 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 ha! Big fucking joke. But think about what that means. I mean, what that basically is telling us as citizens that we should view the government as the enemy. What just happened? It's the culmination, not, it's not just Trump, it's the culmination of a message that the Republican Party has been sending out for years to achieve and hold on to power. They want to demonize the whole concept of government. They want people to think of government as the enemy. Surprise, surprise, when somebody picks up a gun and invades the fucking Capitol. And it is, that's the thing, it ain't just Trump. It's the entire, and I, I, I say this knowing full well that there are 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump and that there are a lot of Republicans in this country and that a lot of people who are very decent, warm-hearted, kind people vote Republican. But I will not shy away from saying what I consider to be a palpable truth, which is that Republicans who have come to believe that government is bad are basically taking a knife and stabbing their own fucking heart. Every time you turn on a tap and clean water comes out, that's government. When you drive on a road that doesn't have potholes, that's government. When you call a cop and he comes to your house to help in the middle of the night because you're you know, getting invaded, that's government. You know, We turn against government, safe drugs, government, unemployment insurance, government, Medicare, government, social security, government, everything that we have come to take for, take a, take for granted like it was just like, you know, that old thing about, you know, born on third base and thought you hit a triple. That's fucking America. 
We were born on third base. We are the recipients of, of progressive legislation going back to the turn of the century that created the conditions that allowed us to live longer, uh, have better medical care, feel safer in our homes, feel safe in with the drugs and the food we consume. That's because people fought for good governance. You know? It is, uh, I don't mind to stop you at all about this because I am extremely passionate as well. I. I told you that my brother was in the Navy. He he fought for this country. He he fought for this country and he God rest his soul, he did his damnedest for he he uh, enlisted right after 9/11. That's what prompted him to to enlist. I'm 27 and he he was 36 when he passed and he it, he enlisted right after 9/11 and I just really think that he would be ashamed and, and the, the culture of denial is just what astounds me. Well, it runs deep and to, to be, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think of America as, as, you know, the, the, our foundational documents are fascinating. The history of America is fascinating. It's really interesting how America came to be. And I can go blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But I, what I don't, what I tend to resist is the idea that somehow as a people, as if we're a separate species, that we're exceptional. People are people all over the fucking world. Some people are, are cool and kind and smart and give a goddamn about the world they live in. But a lot of people, you know, are on some level fundamentally uninterested except insofar as their own immediate concerns are come into play. The old, you know, some of it's anthropological. I mean, going back to our primitive, our primitive selves, fuck, fight, or flee. You know, that's our like, our like, you know, Pleistocene mind, our, our primitive brain. So the idea that you care enough to educate yourself enough to be to be aware enough of all the implications of what goes on in the world so that it will stir you enough to get involved. That's always been a relatively small proportion of people who, 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 who have the good fortune, you know, frankly, and, 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 the, and the, the education and the good parenting and the, and, the, and the bent, the inclination to give a fuck. A lot of people don't give a fuck. And it's pretty easy when you don't really give a fuck to kind of be swayed by a demagogue or to get your passions, you know, excited by somebody who screams loudly and bangs a drum. And then you go, well, that, well I'll get involved about that. And you join a little army and now you're part of a tribe and that feels exciting and that feels cool. It's not political, you know? It's not political in the deepest and, and, and most important sense of the word. It's, it's emotional. And it's rooted in, in something that simply on a visceral level makes you get your dick up in the morning. It's male for one thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm fully, ex I always half the time expect somebody from the Hollywood Food Coalition to call and say, John, shut the fuck up. Because you know, <laughs> our, as a not-for-profit, we don't, there are certain, um, uh, uh, if I'm, we're a 501c3 organization, we do not, um, we're not an advocacy organization. You have to have a separate category to be an advocacy organization. I'm not allowed to go and, you know, fulminate for Hollywood Food Coalition. So uh, my fulmination is entirely John Billingsley fulmination. I do not, and I cannot, and I will not, and I must not have political viewpoints expressed as the president of the board of the Hollywood Food Coalition. But because I end up talking about both things in a single interview, I sometimes find I need to make that delineation really clear. Me, John Billingsley, I get pretty fucking pissed off at what goes on in the world, and I, and I kind of start gabbling. Um, but John Billingsley, the board president of the Hollywood Food Coalition, has no responsibility for the other side of John Billingsley's yeah, political opinions. Correct. And, and then there are six other sides. I mean, I basically it's like civil. I've, I've got like eight. I've got eight personalities. Um, all of them cantankerous. But. <laughs> and you know what? I think, um, quite frankly, a lot of my friends, I think that is what uh, drew them to the cause is, is just your your cantankerousness and you, you're willing to, to just say whatever you feel. And 
my I live in an apartment. I don't know if you can tell, but like, I wonder if my neighbors ever become concerned at the screaming that comes <laughs> from my apartment. <laughs> I'm a total fan girl. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just uh, afraid I'm just an old fucking smart ass is my problem. But you know, what the hell? I, I, I did not actually. Uh, uh, my friend Jay Stoby at Stoby's Galaxy um, has uh, has been kind of like you know nagging me and my other friend uh, who won't allow me to speak her name, but a dear friend of mine um, who's also on Twitter uh kept saying oh you should tweet you should tweet you'd love it you'd love it i was like i don't know i don't know and they said well tweet just so you can kind of beat the drum about the hollywood food coalition it's like okay that makes sense so i joined you know to a certain extent for that purpose and you can only beat the drum for a charity organization for so long and then i thought oh well actually because it's only a limited number of characters you really just are like you know only here to just make jokes I thought, oh, I like making jokes. And then when I figured out that actually, you know, my 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 um, my temperament was better suited to the medium than I realized, uh, I've I've rather taken to it, more so than Facebook. I've pretty much given up on Facebook. I um, I get caught on Facebook like writing these long fucking like you know that nobody reads. <laughs> People always made fun of me. It's like I'm not gonna read that. It's like a tract. <laughs> no, but I can't stop. But Twitter stops you from doing that, which is, uh, you know. Except you can make threads. Which is good. Yes, well. It's hard. <laughs> uh, I got friends I got. I don't get to see them, unfortunately. I so miss the world we used to throw, in, in part because we're social and in part because uh, I think that's how you organize people, is you throw fucking parties. You know, you throw, oh, parties, right. <laughs> you know, throw parties, have guests come, talk about community events, you know, find ways to get people involved in your community by getting them together, not to raise money necessarily, but to raise awareness. So we were big uh, party throwers and I'm, I'm, it's just so, so heart fucking breaking to not be, you know, to have it all be on a screen. Do you it's think, not, um, it ain't my way. Do you think that, uh, cult do you think that conventions will ever come back? Well, I mean, you know, it's hard. It's really, we're in a very dark era. I, I don't know. I mean, 2.8% of the population in the United States has been vaccinated so far. 9.8% of the people who are considered, you know, the most, the most critical who need to be vaccinated, the frontline healthcare workers, uh, people in, in, you know, particularly vulnerable populations. It's really hard to look at the rollout of the vaccine. And I think all of us who understood the, the total incompetence of the Trump administration knew that this was going to happen. But when you look at the rollout of the vaccine and you look at the, and you look at the logistical challenges of vaccinating the entire fucking world and you kind of consider the reality that the virus itself is mutating as has happened in England, notably, as is happening here, and that that mutation is seemingly proving to to you know be more communicable than the previous iteration of a disease. It's really fucking hard for me to be optimistic that we're going to get through this this year. I mean, I I read a lot about it, and and I got to say, the things that to me feel the likeliest would suggest that we we are looking at, at 2022, midway through the year, maybe 2023. And not to be like, you know, I mean, it's very hard for me to not be dystopic in this dystopic world we're living in. It is. But clearly the Biden administration is going to take it seriously. And clearly we are going to have an entirely different um, emphasis um, and that's gonna, that's gotta help, but Let's say that we're able to make enough and distribute enough doses of the vaccine for them to be made available to people. We still have the lunacy of the world where a lot of fucking anti-vaxxers won't take it. Yes. Oh my God. What do you do about that? And then let's say you solve that problem. Let's say on some level, 
you've been able to mandate it. Um, you know, I, frankly, I don't quite know what you're going to do if you don't mandate it. Yeah. You know, you can't fly if you don't show a vaccination certificate. You can't do this if you don't show a vaccination certificate. You can't teach if you don't have a, you know, that's the only way I can think of you actually going to do it. I mean, you know, but let's say you get to the point where you actually are able to vaccinate the population, two doses, you've done the whole fucking world. Let's say you pull that off in two years. It doesn't address the fact that the population right now is so vast in this world that we have encroached on the natural environment to such an extent that a lot of the communicable diseases that pass from animals to humans, we are likely to see more of that. So who knows what the next goddamn disease is going to be? And this in a world in which climate change is also going to be driving, I mean, forgive me, I get, it's oh, very God, hard. I don't mind. It's very hard to look at the ways in which we have fucked up our world for me to be extraordinarily optimistic. And I do try and temper that tendency to be dystopic by, you know, reminding myself of all the good that has happened over the course of the last umpteen years. We have eradicated so many diseases. Nicholas Kristof writes a column every year in the New York Times in which he says, this is the first year he didn't do it. Every year he says, in spite of what's happened, this is the best year in human history. People are living longer, diseases have been eradicated, more people are climbing out of poverty, yada, yada, yada. But Malthus, not the Malthusian theory is, is that the more things, the more things prosper, the more things grow, the more people breed, the more population grows, the more likely you will eventually hit your limits. And then boom, and now you start to contract. And I'm enough of a Malthusian to think climate change is gonna create a, a, the kinds of problems that we only dimly begin to understand right now, including climate refugeeism. When you think of all the populations all around the world whose, whose environments are going to be destroyed, all the people who live on coastlines that are going to be underwater, all the people who live in areas where it's simply, it's a, it was 127 degrees, I think, one day in Pakistan, like a year or so ago. How did people live in certain environments? Those people are going to fucking run. And we see what happens now in a world of climate refugeeism. All these people on the run are running to another country. And people in that country say, we don't want them here. Get out the guns, you know, and become a fascist country to stop. Look at the wall is all about, in essence, they're coming to our country. Ah! Climate refugeeism is going to make that worse and worse and worse. And to me, the risk of that is that it will, it will continue to force more, I shouldn't say force, encourage fascism in response. Australia basically has a, a, in a way, a kind of a concentration camp. All of the various refugees that try and get to Australia from, from parts of the world, either because of political problems or because of ecological problems, that get on the boats and go to Australia, they're intercepted before they land and they are kept on an island off the coast of Australia, in essence, a kind of a fucking prison camp. And Australia just lives with that and it is not spoken of. What the fuck? Yes, what the fuck? What the fuck? And you go around the world, Hungary, what the fuck? Poland, what the fuck? You know, Turkey, what the fuck? Russia, what the fuck? China, what the fuck? The US, what the fuck? You know? So my, my, my kind of like about the fucked up -ness of the world. I say that too, fuck up, fucked up -ness. Yeah, I, having said that, you know, because I, I kind of always play devil's advocate with myself. There are historians who've, who said from 1945 to essentially 1975, roughly speaking, that was the greatest period in the history of the fucking world because we, did so much to eradicate disease, lift people out of poverty. It's a reason we had this incredibly explosive growth, both in population and in world health. It was an incredibly productive period, unlike any 30 year period in the history of the world. That wasn't that long ago when we were doing a lot of things right. Perversely, we are suffering from the success we had during that period of time. And in that sense, history is always a pendulum swing incredibly good stuff happens and and again we you know we hit a wall you know 
prosperity breeds poverty. Poverty breeds peculiarly sometimes prosperity for some. It, everything is connected. I, I, it's possible, you know, that what we are facing right now will pop both technologically and, and politically, which is where I really think the challenge lies, the kinds of solutions that will rejigger the world and bring us to a healthier state of being. Some of that we see, you know, the, the greater green consciousness that exists among many people, the conversations that people are having right now about what is fucked up about our political system and our, our inability to, to collaborate anymore, the nature of what's going on in the world. Intelligent people are having passionate conversations. A lot of people choose not to participate in them because it's complicated and demanding. And in a way, they're just kind of gonna let themselves be acted upon. I think to the extent that, you know, something you asked earlier, what can we do? We can fucking read, you know? We can in be engaged, we can be smart and we can be part of the conversation, you know? I firmly believe that because uh, I, I also firmly believe that no one is perfect. If you want to evolve, and you want to love people, you have to, you have to read, you have to always be teaching yourself, you have to always show empathy, that's a really, really big thing, show empathy, I, I can't tell you, like, um, homelessness, I know homelessness is a very big problem in Los Angeles, and where I live, um, I live in Illinois, I don't know, I think I said mm -hmm. that once, but, um, the the town over where i live there are a lot of homeless people and it's very very sad and I, i'm on disability myself but i i will give my last dollar to those people i i feel your last 14 cents my last 14 cents which is going to me isn't it i thought it was going to my it was going to my uh, it was going to my booze fund i thought weren't you well, sending me for, for the purchase of port there's something special coming to you in your mailbox. Oh my God, is it port? Holy cow, I can't, <laughs> I, I can't remember. I can't remember the jokes I make with you. I, make so many jokes. I love our jokes. Um, uh, yes, I, 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 I agree. I mean, you know, it's nobody's perfect. And, and you know, I mean, <laughs> at 60, I have to say, it's like, if I take stock of myself, it's like, you know, it takes about five hours to just check off all the fucking flaws before I get to the good stuff. It's like, I should start the other side and then find the flaws afterwards. But the ability to say, okay, course correction, course correction, course correction is so integral to being a good human being. The ability to say, I fucked up. I was wrong. I apologize, you know, which is one of the things it's like all this talk right now that's driving me fucking nuts. The Republicans saying, well, we, unity, unity, we need unity. It's like, no, first we need absolution. First, you need to say you're sorry. First you, need to, you know, first you need to say, I get it. I fucked up. I supported this. I encouraged this. You know, even as of yesterday, I was still echoing the lies that it was a fake election. I am complicit. I apologize and I will make it right as best I can. There's no unity without that level of honesty. It, it, and you know what? And in this day and age with the quote unquote cancel culture, it is a very, very hard thing to be vulnerable like that and say that you have been wrong or you were wrong recently or in the distant past. Yeah. Oh, the thing about cancel culture is weird though, because it's like, you know, sometimes I don't want cancel culture to be kind of just like, you know, like politically correct has become like a, a buzz phrase. Cancel culture, it's like, you know, to see the right um, appropriate that phrase, it, it becomes in the mouths of many a way to say, you're trying to stop me from saying things that are racist. Cancel culture, cancel culture. It's just like politically correct. It's like, yeah, but there are certain lines. It's like, there's a reason why we have basically said you cannot use the word, you know, there are reasons why. Historically, culturally, there are reasons why. You don't get to call cancel culture, cancel culture when you're inciting a fucking country to riot. I'm shutting you up because we just had fucking people burst into the Capitol ready to assassinate political leaders because of the shit you have said, mm. you know?
I completely agree. I, 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 I mean, it, all of this is like, there's no, it, it's, it's not, it's hard. It, to be a human being is to wade through a world of gray. I don't believe in black and white. It's extremely complicated. I, I, I have to say, reading recently about um, people who are again saying, ban Huckleberry Finn from our school system because of, you know, its use of the word. It, it, there is a slippery slope. If you start saying that, that, that you tear down the statues of Lincoln because he is not, you know, representative of the values we hold today, Yes, it is possible to so um, uh, uh, um, essentially mar and deface history by only judging it by contemporary standards that you, you, you lose your capacity to understand the evolution of the world. At the same time, that too can be turned into an argument that says, allow all the various statues that were erected after the, uh, you know, in, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, to perpetuate a form of uh, subjugation of the black citizens. All the statues that were built all over this country, you know, honor, honoring Confederate heroes, it was part and parcel of an effort to try and suppress the black population after the death of reconstruction. So those, those statues have to be viewed in their, in their deepest historical context. That is something separate and distinct from a statue erected of Abraham Lincoln. Huckleberry Finn speaks against racism. You don't, you lose the forest for the trees when you try and suppress or edit something without understanding it in its fullest historical context. The context is key. I, I feel, especially in that case, with a book so aged in this, in this day and age, I feel like it's important for that to still be taught or to be available to be taught on because, I mean, you can't just delete that from you history. Can't. You, you can't. You can't. I mean, you, can't. you know, Plato believed in slavery. You know, you're not going to teach Plato, you know, you can't, I mean, you know, you're not going to teach Voltaire, you're not going to teach Montana. I mean, you can go, go, go through the history of the great writers of the world, and there is something objectionable because they were a product of their time. But you have to have enough education and historical context to be able to appreciate why they were nonetheless progressive, why they were nonetheless in the stream of progressive thought. Unfortunately, we, we are not, and this has always been the case, a very small proportion of people in the history of the world have chosen to become educated, who choose to read, who choose to give a fuck, who choose to want to read the paper every day. That's a small portion of the population. And a lot of people are very easily swayed on, a, on, a, on an emotional pitch to weigh in on shit without understanding the complexity of it. And I, I realize that sounds arrogant to say, like, who the fuck are you? I, I you know, I'm no expert, but, but I, I have spent a good portion of, of my life trying to be an educated person, you know? I've it's, always, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, I you know, I, I think that's, you know, to me, that's, that's, you know, I kind of come back around to what are the solutions? What are the solutions? I put, we have got to buck up and reinforce. Betsy DeVos was a nightmare, a nightmare. The idea, we have not had a federal commitment to building a strong network of public schools in our country. I was lucky when I grew up, I went to a decent public school in a relatively wealthy suburb of Connecticut. We had great teachers, we had small classes, we had all sorts of, of wonderful, what people called ancillaries, which meant home ec and shop and music and theater and et cetera, and et cetera. Things that in my opinion, make you a decent and well-rounded person. I didn't learn a lot from math class, but I learned a shitload from drama class. Right, you know? yes. And I see these schools today where it's like, a friend of mine, a public school teacher in Los Angeles, he now has, I mean, obviously the schools aren't in session, everything's Zoom, but 40 plus kids in a class, uh, multiplicity of languages, multiplicity of learning styles, very little parental support, and the expectation that they're all going to be able to handle the same material 
people are put into that class who have behavioral issues, people who are put in, into a class who have, have psychological issues. And the idea that some, some group of people are, are gonna, are, that everybody's gonna learn something, it's like, it's, it's a disgrace. It's a national disgrace. S some of, of, and I get this federal system that says a lot of power devolves to the states. And in many respects, there's much that is advantageous about it. I think a lot of what has preserved this, this country during the arc of the last four years is that there were power centers, California, New York, et cetera, where states could say, fuck you. Fuck you, Donald Trump. Cities could, you know, counties could. There are all sorts of, the diffusion of power through the constitution is one of the great things about the constitution. The flip side of that is it makes it awfully hard for our country to come together and say, things like educational standards matter for everybody. And it's not okay for a state like Mississippi, you just pick on a state arbitrarily, to say, we don't give a flying fuck whether our kids are educated because we'd rather have serfs than citizens. That to me is a question of where the federal government has an obligation to help enforce certain agreed upon standards. And on an educational front, I think we've abandoned that. And consequently, our population gets dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. You know? The, the uneducation, the, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's frankly <clears throat> quite appalling. Um, illiteracy actually, <sighs> I feel I think is quite common around here. I live in Southern Illinois. And every time I say I live in Illinois, they're like, oh, are you by Chicago? No, I am nowhere near Chicago. I know where you are. Yeah, no, I know. No, you're, yeah. you're, you know, you're in the Indiana, Kentucky uh, nexus. Yeah. And I am also in the middle of a red county. Yeah. And, and it's a very hard thing. And also speaking about the pandemic, I feel like the very foundation of our country, I mean, God bless it, freedom, hell yeah. But I feel like the very foundation of it is what allows people to be like, well, fuck no, I'm not going to wear that mask. America. Yeah. It, fr freedom is, is, you know, to me, you don't get freedom without responsibility. I mean, I, I'm free because a lot of people took a certain responsibility on to fight for that freedom. And to protect me and to and you know i'm free because a lot of people agreed to pay their taxes i'm free because a lot of people uh created structures and institutions that preserved our nation in in a, you know i mean we almost didn't even enter the second world war i mean if it wasn't if we hadn't been attacked by the japanese we probably would have we probably would have not fortunately we had some people roosevelt being one of them who understood that we would not be free if we did not fight for our freedoms and he pre and he prepared the way so that when japan attacked we had a whack at entering that fight and winning you know we have an obligation now in this fight against a, a horrible disease to fucking support the country and the world and that means that you sacrifice you know, the way our forefathers have sacrificed to see people so unwilling and so and so resistant to sacrifice and confusing that with freedom. That to me is irresponsibility and selfishness. Um, and, and it's profoundly undemocratic and profoundly un-American. Mm, I just I really. Like you said, I really don't see an end to it in the immediate future. But no, I just I don't either. I mean, I don't. I just, I just I wish I could say I do. I mean, I, I know like Fauci is trying to be optimistic. He's trying to suggest that by the autumn we'll have turned that a poor man. And, that poor man. I know that poor man. I, and and what, a, what an amazing man. What an amazingly courageous man. He just fucking shows up every day. He's Christ. just trying to do his job. <clears throat> yeah. Undercut at every turn. But I I I you know, again, I read, I read a lot, a lot about this stuff. And I got to say, I, I appreciate the, the need, even the need to try and, and bolster our sense of possibility and to be a positive voice. So I don't want to be, as I probably am coming off today, like, you know, such a, a negative Gus that I don't have, hold out any hope w with the coming of the Biden administration and possibly with this, this, I hope. This, this need to call 
the people who fucked up our country to the carpet, maybe we will be able to make some political shifts that will allow the vaccine to be distributed more fairly, equitably, and intelligently. Maybe we will allow a political change in the weather to bring more people into obeying mask restrictions, to obeying social distancing. But again, I look at what happened on the House floor, even as there was an insurrection raging, literally outside the goddamn room, there were a bunch of Republicans lying around waving off the masks, saying, I don't need a mask. Just yesterday, people, because they had to install a, a metal inspector. In I was going to bring that up. Because there's a reason they installed a metal, a metal detector. And it's because Republicans have consistently been saying, the election is fake. The election is fake. You're being robbed. You're being robbed. Let's do something about it. Go, sorry, you know actually fomenting this riot. People attack the Capitol. Now they have to put metal detectors in and the very self-same Republicans say, this is an outrage. Metal detectors forcing me to leave my gun. This is it's like, fuck you, pal. Own the metal detector. Yeah. It's old. One of the politicians said- There are no Republicans watching this at this point. I, I, we have like lost, uh, there's no, I always, every interview I ever do, every podcast, I always think, how many minutes is it gonna be before the, any Republican watching has abandoned it? <laughs> <laughs> Usually <laughs> about 30 seconds. Challenge, is let's do a speed run. But um, one of the politicians, and she was an African-American female, and I just, I was like, you are a fucking queen. And I thought this was hilarious because I've yeah. worked at McDonald's myself. Oof. I worked at McDonald's myself. And she said, this is the same thing as working at McDonald's, the metal detectors. Yeah, wear you your uniform. uniform. You don't work that day. And yeah. it's true. They will not let you work. Yeah, no, she's, she, I, I like her too. I can't remember spacing on her name. And Me, I, I cannot. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I struggle with this all the time. Seventy-four million people voted for Donald Trump a second time. You know, you make your allowance to a certain extent for some of the people who voted for him the first time, but the second time, it's like there was a willful, a willful disregard for his racism, a willful disregard for his misogyny, a willful disregard for his stupidity, a willful disregard for his cruelty. And 74 million people were willing to avert their eyes from that shit. More people voted in this election than ever. Yeah, and, and thanks, thank you, the 81 million people who voted for Joe Biden, but the 74 million people I acknowledge as individuals living their lives day in, day out, going to the grocery store, petting their dog, having fun with their kids, a civic life, that there is great kindness there. I know there is. I, 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 I very rarely meet somebody that I don't think on a one-to-one -one level isn't kind. But I, I, I'm still left really grappling with how somebody who as a decent person on their, on their day in, day out, you know, encounters could be so willfully blind to the reality of what Donald Trump represents in this world. I, and it leaves me bumfuzzled as to how, to one, just on a personal level, have conversations with people who, who support Donald Trump, but on a political level, how to begin to try and, I mean, I get it. You can't kind of pull people back in after you've made them feel like you don't even want to talk to them. So I don't, I can understand why 70 more, 74 million people, if they were listening to this, wouldn't say, fuck you. Why would I want to have anything to do with you? You've just demonized me and, and kicked me to the curb. And I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. I don't either, really. I feel like um, there's a polarization and it really, I don't know. It is just, Trump just has to go away. He, he just does. needs to fall into a goddamn hole and in trying to keep himself from falling, he needs to grab onto into Junior, who needs to grab onto the other fucking brother, who needs to grab onto Ivanka, who needs to grab onto Jared, and they all need to go down together. They do. I just and, and that will be a start. That will be a start. I, and I, oh, I'm so glad I remembered this. 
I firmly believe that we need to elect more young people to Congress and, and Senate positions. I really yeah, think- Look at Marjorie Taylor Greene. I mean, it's not, I wish it was possible to say it's young people and women, but unfortunately I have to say, and somebody in the post wrote a great article about this the other day, basically saying, well, you know, you look at some of the gals and you look at some of the young people and it's like, it's not that easy. Unfortunately, you know. You pick and choose, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot. Civics, civics is another thing. I mean, I, I that should be mandatory in every school, and 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 we need to have we need to have a, a better civics education. People need to uh, even the this idiot uh, Tommy uh, Tuberville or Tuberville. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. The new senator from Alabama who was elected because he was a famous football coach who oh. didn't understand you know the separation of powers really or the the three different branches of government. I mean, it's like. How, you know what are you doing like what are you doing yeah i mean the last whack the republicans had they could have elected a child molester so i will say that an ignoramus is better than a child molester so alabama is you know slowly now i've not only alienated the republicans i've alienated the alabamans we don't want any of those fucking people anyway <laughs> not yeah. like just general alabamans we're talking about the, the extremely gross ones. i know i know and i I've, <laughs> I've, you know i lived in alabama i lived in huntsville alabama as a kid i read that about you like not just yeah. like a super stock or anything but i was trying to cover my base no, okay. well you've, you've read widely yes i don't i didn't know that was out in the world yes i, I lived all over the all over the place and and some places now they wouldn't you know if i, oh. I showed up on the out on the town limits <laughs> i'd be tarred and feathered <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just have a few questions left. Yeah. That are kind of random. I tried to stick to a category, but it kind of didn't really. It just panned out as it panned out, and I, quite frankly, I think oh, that's quite all right. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, you know, sometimes it's all very frivolous and funny, and then I, it's really hard these days because I I'm just, to be addressed. so fucking angry as as are so many people to not be extremely mouthy about the world we're in. Do you want to hear something funny? I'm a mouthy woman and like the, the Salem witch tri trial days or whatever, they would have burned me at the stake. I wouldn't have survived. I have a lot to say. <laughs> well, that's what people, people have asked me upon occasion, why don't I get into politics? It's like, you know, do you know me? Have you talked to me? <laughs> How long do you think I'd last on a fucking stage? Whoops. We should all, me and all of my Trekkie friends should move to like your state and your district and just like vote you into a public. Yeah, but my, my problem is he's already a cool guy in my district. The only point of running would be to run in a district to take a seat away from somebody who's an asshole. And I couldn't oh, win in that district. You don't even need it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I would just be unseating another cool liberal guy who's smarter than I am. <laughs> yeah, it's just like pointless. You know, we want to we want to make some change here, not take uh, somebody a job away that's doing good. No, I know. I should move to your district. No, <laughs> should move to your district. We need help. And and I would get crucified. I would fight for you, but we need help. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, uh, random, quick fire, doesn't fit into any category. I just want to say I loved you in True Blood. That was hilarious. <laughs> I didn't know that you could put on a really good Southern affectation. That was delicious. I, that I was don't know if that was a good Southern uh, Southern accent or not, but but it was fun. It was a fun show. I mean, I, I you know, I was in it so uh, glancingly. That uh, that you know I, I don't even think about it. Although I cash the checks. Thank <laughs> I'm uh, sorry if my laughs are like deafening you, but you're no 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 you're fine you're fine you're fine you're fine you're fine. <laughs> did um, you um did you pick where you bit her or like because I know you like <laughs> I, no, I did I I was not allowed I I didn't I, I didn't succeed in biting her. <laughs> I, 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 well, I know fall, she killed you, but like I was I was stabbed with. Uh, now I will tell you what I think. I, this is a, perhaps apocryphal. This is what I heard in that fifth season. I think, you know, I, I I was in it up until the third season, and then they didn't use me. And then in the fifth season, yeah, they true. they started using me again, and they started using me kind of like you know, like I, I kept coming up late to a crime scene. It was like, where where, where were you, coroner? It's like, oh, I I got held up. Well, that was odd. I, it turned out what I'm told is that 
they were envisioning if you do you know the show pretty well uh i'm not an aficionado okay. maybe a, i know the if you watched it this may be a spoiler yeah. alert. it turned out that the sheriff you know that kind of like that little scrawny guy who played the sheriff who turned out to be a villain yeah that was supposed to be me because they didn't think he was going to be available so they started writing the episodes to, to, to surprise everybody with me turning out to be the villain. And then it turned out he was available. So now he became the villain. And suddenly it was like, oh, well, what do we do with John? So they killed me off. Well, those rat bastards, that offends me. <laughs> and actually, that little guy whose name is escaping me, who's, who's you know, who was on the, the second incarnation of a New Heart show as Larry Larian. I don't know if you did you ever watch the the New Heart show? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not. Okay. That he, he's he's a very famous character actor. He was also the mayor in Deadwood, and a really sweet, sweet, self-effacing guy. He wouldn't even sit in his cast chair. It's like, oh, I don't deserve a chair. I'll just sit on this rock. <laughs> it's like that is sweet. <laughs> you're nuts. You're nuts. Such a sweet man. So I was okay with it. I couldn't be the villain. Let him be the villain. That's so funny how Hollywood works. How like if something happens, they'll just kill somebody off. It's and they had a pack one while I'm telling stories about True Blood. You know, there's a there was a scene in the uh, end of the like, second season, I guess, when uh, Michelle Forbes plays the sorceress and everybody in the town. That's that's the orgy season when <laughs> we're all fucking each other every every single episode. Which I have to say was cold it was mostly that was like a cold season it was like i don't want to take my clothes off it's freezing out <laughs> but at the end of that uh, season i'm supposed to kind of in one scene pull out a pack one down to the floor you know i'm a, I'm a raper I mean, i'm the demon is in me and she conks me on the head of the frying pan nah. and uh so we get to the set and you know it's, it's like <laughs> i like anna pack one but the disgust in her eyes that she was going to have to actually engage in something even akin to sexual congress with me. And I, I really, I, I was like, I just wanted to say, I'm standing right here. I can see your naked aversion. You, you could, you're a fucking actress. Could you hide? You're like, just pretend a little. Yeah. <laughs> could you hide your repulsion? This isn't in character repulsion. This is Anna Paquin directed at John Billingsley repulsion. So I doubt Anna Pack would have watched it. But if she is, Anna, I caught it. I saw it. It registered. And now I'm just letting the world know. <laughs> I, have, I have many ingenue stories. This Character is actors engaging with ingenue. We, uh, <laughs> I was on the X-Files. And uh, who's that lady on the X-Files? What's her name? Uh, 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 no clue. I'm woefully and yeah. uneducated. M M Mulder and Scully, whichever one she was, I think it was Scully anyway, the very famous actress. And there was a scene in which I was supposed to grab her from behind and inject her with, I was the villain, and inject her with a, you know, a shot and that turns her into a zombie or whatever the fuck. So, you know, rehearsal and I grab her from behind and she was, oh, 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 my ribs, oh, he's killing me. It was like, I, I'm, 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 fuck you. You're like, I'm just a dude. I'm doing I'm just, like. I was so gentle. I was extra gentle. It's like the director says, you got to make it look in the, and the. So after that, it was like, huh. So I've always watched her career with a jaundiced eye, even though, <laughs> she's, a, even though she's a great actress. I'll always remember the, like, you know. You're like, I know what you character. did. I oh. So oh, offended, like what's up? Uh, All right, what's next lightning round question. Okay, okay. Um, I also loved you in um, the West Wing. That was really good. That map scene, that that was really good. And also, um, I have to ask you about kielbasa, or do you call it? Oh, I just made that up. I just made that up. I don't know. I have no particular passion for kielbasa. I like. I mean, I like. I. I should be a vegan. If I gave enough of a fuck about the world, I'd be a vegan. But unfortunately, that's my bridge too far. I have a lot of friends in PETA. I have a lot of friends who are vegetarians and vegans, and they're kind of like always rolling their eyes at me. <sighs> you know what you're doing to me right now? Like, do you, can you see the disappointment in my face? 
What? Oh, did you send me kielbasa? I will like it. Yeah, I will no. Enjoy it. <laughs> no, it's like I have these questions, and you're like, oh, I lied about that. Oh, I just made that up. I just. Oh yeah, it. well that's yeah, yeah yeah. I'm 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 you know I'm not like a Trumpian liar. I mean, it's not like twenty five thousand lies a day, you're but I've been known to. <laughs> And exaggerate, it. you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. As <laughs> the famous adage goes. You're like a fisherman. You tell a tall tale. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Tell a tall tale. What is, um, what's the craziest thing you've ever done at a convention? And there's only a couple more of these, I promise, and I'll leave you alone. That's, that's, uh, I don't even know where to begin answering that question. Um, Give me the best one. Wow. Yeah. My, 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 I tried to shampoo an audience member's hair. Here's the thing for me. Uh, I, I always thought the uh, Q and a, uh, when I first started going to conventions, I, I kind of thought it was fucking boring because a lot of people need to sit in a chair and it's the same questions and yada, yada. And I, I, I my instinct, um, uh, I, so I thought, you know, what I like about this format is it's like, it's, it's 55 minutes or an hour. And, and the audience already likes me. So I don't have to do what most like, you know, stand-up guys have to do, which is kind of get an audience to kind of start laughing. They, were, they already liked me, which gave me permission to do things. So, so I, I started running around the audience and if people started to leave, I'd run out in the halls and I'd try and drag them back and I'd, I'd pass up fruitcake or I'd shampoo somebody's hair. And then I, I, I started, uh, and I, my wife would come. And so she would heckle me from the back. And then eventually I got her on the stage and we'd run around together. And it was all very physical, which I kind of liked. Um, I like the I like the low vaudeville aspect of it. I, I as 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 I got older, I also became, as I got older as I <laughs> as it became harder for me to be so physical. I tried to figure out other ways to goose the audience. So I started by uh, I started I created three little baggies, and I said, okay, uh, first prize for the person who asks me the most embarrassing question is, and I would write a poem. Uh, for every every convention, and and the first prize would get the poem, and the poem would be something that you know, like some bit of doggerel that I would you know, like you who've won first prize today will blah blah blah, 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 and the second prize would be like a bag of my toenail clippings, and the third bet and the third prize would be like whatever toiletries I could scrounge from the maid's cart that I would steal while she wasn't looking, <laughs> and so I would lay these out, and I would say okay. I don't want to hear the bullshit questions about how long did it take to have makeup, yada, yada, yada. Do your best. Let's hear some of the embarrassing questions. <laughs> and and, and um, so that, that kind of gave the conventions a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of feel. <laughs> I it made it fun that. for me anyway. It doesn't mean I always told the truth. I'm very hard, to, very, I'm very hard to embarrass. But once people began to get into the flow of it, it meant that I could turn around and start embarrassing them, you see. So it allowed me to unleash my inner demon. And so, we love it though. We just uh, eat it up. Consequently, it's hard for me to pick the most, you know, et cetera, et cetera thing. We got, my wife and I got a standing ovation in, in Germany. I think I came on stage without my pants and she rushed up and tried to put my pants on and la 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 da da da, da and then we ran around and uh, and that was actually <laughs> I'm proud of that moment because it was opening night Germany throws big conventions like thousands of people Do opening night and and I was on like at 11 fucking o'clock at night and before me Nichelle Nichols at 9 and Edward James almost at 10 now now you know big stars, but also uh, uh, people who by nature are not quite as puckish as I am. And so the, 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 their presentations were a little bit more, you know, Edward James almost was very like, and another thing about Battlestar Galactica that you should know. And Nichelle Nichols, lovely woman that she is, was also kind of like, you know, kind of holding forth about, you know, blah, blah, blah. anyway, at 11 o'clock at night, it was like, oh my God, these fucking people have been sitting here for at least four hours and it's just been kind of like, you know, <sighs> hence my decision to come out without my pants. It was like, I need a change of tone. So at the end of that hour, to get a standing ovation, I felt like was, a, you know, probably one of my proudest moments in Star Trek. Is that one of your proudest moments? That, that was one of my questions. It was one of the moments when my wife and I, because she was there, 
I think that was one of the, you know, it, it's a wonderful treat. My wife's an actress. It's a wonderful treat to act with your wife. There are a limited number of opportunities you can do that in this medium, you know, my wife and I aren't stars. We're not, you know, cast on the basis of our, our recognizability. We get cast together upon occasion and it's always great, but the conventions were a wonderful opportunity for us to play together. And that, and that spirit that I really, that's what I miss about the conventions, being able to go to the conventions with my wife and perform together on stage and make fun of each other and run around and have a blast. I love my wife very, very much. And, 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 and she claims to love me. So for us to have a chance to, she's also a very good liar. So for us to have a chance to kind of, you know, like, like fizz together, uh, those are very special memories for me. I think that is so sweet. And I'm like having a fangirl moment, okay? Because certainly you've noticed because you've typed it out that I'm Mrs. McCoy on Twitter. I am nuts for DeForest Kelly. And he always brought his wife to conventions. And I think that's adorable that you do that or did that. Well, it's one, uh, I, we always wanted to go on vacation. So it's like, you know, we go to a convention and then we try and tack a vacation on afterwards. So it's like, we got to go to New Zealand. We got to go to Australia. We got to go to, you know, all over England. We got to go to, to Germany. I mean, I, I, that's one of the great things about Star Trek is it's like, you know, it's a paid vacation. But two, the thing that's always struck me about Star Trek is that it's such a familial experience. You know, parents inculcate, perhaps, perhaps overly so, their kids in the culture of Star Trek the fans coming together all the time at conventions become a family in their own right. The idea that you bring your own partner and that she gives a fuck and she's an actress and they know her too. It means that you are saying my family wants to be part of your family. And I think it says something that allows the bonding and the fun to be, you know, more, more um, intense. I think, I think it's, it's basically saying we, we are here in essence as intimates you know as much as anything which sometimes meant we would drink too much frequently it meant we would drink too much i hate to say there were nights it was like we probably should not have stayed for that sixth manhattan that was probably unwise but you know what are you gonna do oh um i guess i just have like two favors to ask of you and then yeah. i'll like leave you alone because i feel terrible i feel like i'm keeping you from no no, no. Oh, i guess it's getting late yeah all right i should get to go i should go to work yes. <laughs> okay, I have two favors. favors i'm like really nervous right now to ask you this number one being would you follow me on twitter oh don't i no Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not very good at that. I'm sorry. I, I, I realize that that's something that you're expected to do, that when people follow you, you're supposed to follow them, and it never occurs to me. So. Well, yes, I'm like I nobody, but I was just wondering, like, if you would. Uh, yes, of course I will. I'll do that right now. Oh, you're so sweet. I love you. Like, really? The fan no, 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 is I... out in full force right now. Oh, no. It just, it just never, you know, it just never it really had... Nine, nine, very few things enter my mind, really. It's like there's basically just a, a, a great empty maw in there. Of like, I sent you an email. I don't know if you got it. I didn't expect you to, like, listen to it or anything, but I did send you my little introductory episode, like 0 0.5, just so, like, maybe you could know what you were walking into. Oh, yes, I did see that, but no, I'm afraid I didn't listen to that. But it, I that's all right. You're, you're, I think you're very esteemed and very important, so... I, oh, well, I, I just, I thought it was, oh, so I got, well, okay, I'm good for you, but I probably, nothing I see is going to change my fundamental affect or way of being, so. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I guess that's everything that I need, and I just want to tell you be, how beyond grateful I am, even though I've expressed that already profusely in email form. My pleasure. Mm. Happy to, my, now, how many podcasts have you done so far? I, that 0.5 was literally it Zero, that so was so one. i does am i like 0.5 do i take you up to one no full you're podcast? episode one so i'm i'm your first episode you are I, this, this is a deal this is a pilot i'm like i'm like your pilot you're on a pilot yeah you are i got a i got a pilot yes. i got a pilot 
Well, all right. I, I hope this uh, I hope this is the first of many. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't know if it um, matters to you, but my friends are extremely hyped up about this. Like, well, cool. I'm so glad. Well, good, good, good. You know, I'm afraid I'm one of those guys who'd like go to the opening of an envelope if there's a free breakfast attached. So <laughs> getting me is hardly a big get in the like if you've got like Jonathan Frakes. Now that'd have been a big deal. Oh, it's impossible right. to get him. That. Well, if you had the blackmail that I have, that would be easier. But, you know, unfortunately, I have to kind of hold that for my own purposes. If I said to Jonathan Frakes, Jonathan Frakes, I want you here in an hour for a tummy rub, he would be here. Is that right? Can I, is that, do I need to edit that out? No, you can keep that in. Um, you can keep that in. Jonathan Frakes, every time you ever, every time I ever see him, he eventually pinches my ass. It's like, Jonathan Frakes, stop that. Ow, Jonathan Frakes, stop that. So he can he can fucking take it. He can take it and he can dish it out. This whole podcast has just been mm -hmm. pontificating and, and just being hilarious and me just laughing like a lunatic. Well, certainly pontificating. You're the yeah. second person to call me a pontificator in two days, so I must really be a pontificator. You uh, or a bloviator. You're prolific. No, don't uh, don't be don't be so humble. You're prolific. Oh, I have a lot <laughs> to be humble about, as the old saying goes. Uh, um, yeah. All right, a pleasure. Yeah, I'm going to be done with you. I'm going to uh, leave you alone, not be done with you. I'll never be done with you. I'm going to send you a self-addressed stamped envelope. Fabulous. <laughs> it sounds like there might be a kielbasa in it. From, from, uh, from. Well, something smaller because like I said, I'm broke for now, but I'll get you something. You're, just, you're going to send me the actual 14 cents, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I can send you 14 cents yeah. if you want. You, don't, you, have not, you do not need to send me anything, but if it's already on the way, then I will look forward to its arrival. Just, just nod and accept. All right, and I'm, I'm sorry if I was a downer today. I'm obviously angry about the state of the world. Generally speaking, I'm joyful in my, my life for what that's worth. I Even knew what I was getting into. Dyspeptic in my politics these days. Mm. Uh, better days though, Excelsior. Better days, Excelsior, live long and prosper. And I hope I you and your that. wife, your lovely wife stay well. Thank you, much obliged. Much obliged, you Bye. have a great one, Alba. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.